Hi, welcome to this edition of On Tap, presented by FCSI of the Americas. I'm Wade Kaler, Executive Director. On Tap this week, we welcome a longtime member who has spoken many times at conferences for me, as well as many, many other conferences throughout the years. He's a former NFL draft pick, franchise guru, working with many brands such as Firehouse Subs, Hooters, Melting Pot, and many, many, many others. He's an incredible author and writer, in addition to always being fun to chat one-on-one with. Please welcome the founder of Bill Main & Associates, Mr. Bill Main. Hey, Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Who were you talking about, by the way, there? <laughs> some guy I've met uh, along the way. <laughs> I don't know, some stranger that... Uh, that uh, just came across one day when I was surfing the web. <laughs> so, Bill, you've got a long career, a very, a very successful career um, with many different brands, many different things. But let's let's go back a little bit. We don't have to do the whole history thing, I guess. But tell me about your background, how you got started in food service industry, and and a little bit, you know, the the elevator pitch of what your career has been like so far. Well, essentially, my original, once I got out of college, I was pretty much committed to football as a career going right. forward, at least in the interim. And uh, I, I realized fairly quickly, and back in those days, of course, it wasn't anywhere near as <laughs> lucrative as it is today, but there was a lot of interconnectivity between restaurant, restaurants and team team play, if you will. Okay. And so... I realized that the skill sets that I developed as a football player at a reasonably high level, uh, I didn't play actively um, in the pros, but I was with the Steelers for a while and I was in Canada for a while, um, were very complementary to food service and hospitality. And I sort of drifted into restaurants at that point and figured out very early that um, I wanted to be my own boss. and wanted to make my own decisions. So I really went to work to learn the, learn the business from the inside out as a hands-on day-to-day practitioner. And that evolved into uh, a lot of contacts with a lot of what I'll call independents and emerging chains. Um, mm-hmm. There are thousands and thousands of, of single unit independents that have an opportunity yeah. to become what, what I call emerging chains. Yeah. And what I realized very quickly, because I'd experienced it myself as a hands-on operator, that they didn't have the systems and the guidelines and the tools to do it. And so that really is where it all, where it all started many, many years ago with my own yeah. independent restaurant. What's one chain that kind of caught you by surprise? That maybe you didn't, you, you thought it, it had potential, but maybe not, but then it took off. Boy, that's a tough call. There, there were a lot of them. One that I didn't work with specifically except on the periphery i was never retained by them was in and out okay i think in and out burger is probably the greatest phenomenon <laughs> at least in the quick service segment of anybody i've ever seen i i was on the board of directors of the california restaurant association and had the opportunity to meet the founder of in and out burger and we became friends and i got a chance to to at board meetings and so forth to just kind of observe as a third party their evolution as a company and i i think they are truly truly a phenomenon at least in my life life experience and what do you attribute that phenomenon to because i agree with you it's one of those brands that when you say it most everybody either they one have never heard of it because they've never traveled out west or been exposed to it or they hear it and the moment they hear it they go oh you know it's one of those like yes that's so good is it, is it, do you attribute it to the fact that they consciously have not gone too big and, and, or too fast? Like, I know they're still opening up once in a while, but they're still one of those brands that is so well known, but yet doesn't want to grow exponentially. I think that's a fair representation. Um, the key to in and out is, is a, in, in a simple world is ex- consistent execution. Yes. And, they they and of course simplicity and if you've got if you're in the food service hospitality game you're dealing with a different labor force yeah then then you're dealing with an emerging labor force young people right and though that's where the simplicity of execution for them 
is so important. The second part of their unique positioning, obviously, is a spectacular product yes. from a price value point of view. I mean, from a price mm -hmm. value point of view, it's almost laughable to yeah, compare you're right. in and out to, to their competitors. And I have nothing but respect for their competitors. I've worked with McDonald's. I've worked with Burger King at a, at a very primary level. And in and out is a spectacular um, example of bringing quality and consistency and location. They are meticulous yeah. in their attention to detail. Yeah, And Unless I love that. And let's not forget, they're one of the, probably the, not founders, but one of the most well-known secret menu item restaurants that are out there. Meaning that there yeah. is a whole menu that you don't know about. When you walk in that store, if you aren't familiar with the secret menus, you have no clue how big that menu can be <laughs> from a from a perspective. But when you do realize what it is, you realize that, and, and all the employees know those. It's not like that's yes. really a secret. They, to your point, they know exactly how to execute those hidden menu items without fail every single time. And that creates intrigue. Yes. And that creates word of mouth, which of course is an incredible and cost-effective way to build your brand. Yeah. And the, the, and they did it all because they didn't have to. In other words, they <laughs> they essentially said we don't have to do that. We can do it the way we want to do it. Yeah. Which is not true typically in the in the corporate store franchising world. It's all about Correct. growth, growth, growth. And and yeah. and they never had the, the those uh restraints. Yeah. What what do you consider your and I know this might be very difficult to answer, so I'll I'll modify it a little bit. I was gonna ask you what your favorite project is you've ever worked on, but I know that might be very difficult because your career is you've worked with some amazing clients. So what are a couple of your top projects or couple companies you've worked with that you really, really enjoyed? Well, my sweet spot is the words I use a lot, which is trying to make complicated simple. And over the last 20 years, the business, as we all know, has not gotten simpler. It's no. gotten more and more complex, more and more convoluted, more and more government involvement in what we do day to day, a changing labor force. The complications and the challenges are significant. I think one of them, one of the projects that I really enjoyed and was, was uh, uh, I think, pretty successful with was uh, Harris Ranch mm -hmm. down in uh, southern San Joaquin Valley. Most people have heard of Harris Ranch beef. And they're primary, one of the greatest uh, steaks in the world. And um, they do it all there. Mm. They raise the cattle, they slaughter the cattle, they prepare everything, and they've taken it all the way to the full-service sit-down restaurant. So wow. when I worked with them initially, they wanted a second opinion on how they were viewed as a brand. And um, so I had the great, great opportunity to really see every square foot of their facilities from a restaurant restaurant tours point of view and um, in staying in alignment with their simple high quality great price value approach we built a full service operation they'd had one that we enhanced and improved by laying in a lot of the systems and protocols and guidelines that I call best practices in the full service segment that was that was really enjoyable also i i worked with uh, purdue farms okay um, I, I i always laugh that you know there's beef and chicken and <laughs> and purdue farms of course was chicken and i got a chance to work with them from a manufacturer's point of view which was really interesting um how is the product perceived in the marketplace and how can we create a unique selling proposition Hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. So those are the two that I think I have the most uh, pride about and enjoyed the most. Nice. You know, it's very rare that you see a consultant become a president of uh, a restaurant association. And not only that, when you were president of the California Restaurant Association, probably one of the most, if not the most prestigious one of the state restaurants associations. Uh, and you were a member for many years and served as a president. What are some of the accomplishments that when you were on the board that you're most proud of? Well, I think in 
all state restaurant associations, and Texas is a good example, Illinois, Pennsylvania, mm. they, they are primarily dominated by single unit operators or small emerging chains. Um, the major uh, food service hospitality companies don't like their message to be diluted yeah. at a state restaurant association. Now, that's a gross generalization, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay. But generally speaking, the great ideas and the innovation come from the independents, and the, and the chains create the financial muscle to, you know, expand and grow. So I think in my year as president, what we were as association trying to figure out was how can we serve both of those constituencies and mm. um, at the same time? And I spent a lot of time and I traveled a lot and I talked to a lot of them. And, and I was pure in my perspective because mm. I had never been yeah. in the corp in the corporate business. I had never worked in my 40 plus years. I've never worked for anybody else ever. I've never yeah. collected a paycheck. And so I had a kind of a one dimensional view of the world. And it was always the view of the world is what does the guest see? What, how do we convert the initial trial of a guest into a return visit? And then how do we turn them into a lifetime customer and, and guest? And I think the simplicity of that approach, it was pure, nobody would, could disagree with it, was really pure. And yeah. um, it gave me an opportunity to really do something that I had never really had an opportunity to do, which was yeah. put a kind of a competitive spin to it. What makes one football team better than another? Right. If you watch the NFL, if you watch college, what makes them, they're all great teams. They've all got great players. What's the difference? Why are some so more successful? And it comes down to the culture. Yeah. And that culture is exactly what I brought to that position as president for that couple of years. Nice. I know, uh, you know, uh, one of the things you and I have known each other for a long time. And one of the things I've heard you talk about in the past about, you know, the the customer and the view of the customer. And because of that, it's kind of how I do my event planning for conferences and events for my clients is I view it as I plan it as if I was the attendee coming through the door, not the conference planner coming in, because I don't care how complicated it makes it on my life. I want to make it easier for that attendee when they walk through the door. What's their experience versus what's my experience is trying to run the place. So uh, it's very similar. I've never managed a restaurant. I've worked in a bunch of different restaurants and different uh capacities, but I've never managed one. But I always loved that philosophy that you had, which was designed for the, the customer walking in the door. So that's kind of I've, I've stolen that idea from you a little bit on the event side too now, which is always plan the conference for what the attendee is going to be like. And I know that I've got colleagues in the industry of, of event planning that don't do that still they plan what makes it easier on them. And that's usually the mistakes that are made. Well, I think that's, again, the same, the same mindset. Yeah, we're saying the same thing. Yeah, my philosophy, my philosophy on that way is that I don't want a restaurant tour as as a leader of FCSI. Yeah, I want somebody who understands the totality of the industry that's open to input. Right. And if there's one thing you know about restaurant tours is they got egos and they got experience. <laughs> Yeah. And they got, it's their money, a lot of them, that they've lost or won. And there isn't one of them that won't tell you the story about, I lost <laughs> 500000 here, I lost a million there. And I was right there, too, as a restaurateur. Yeah. So that, to me, is the greatest effectiveness of FCSI. It's why I stay affiliated and, and, and supportive, is yeah. because you and your team is not trying to be the classic uh leader of an association in many ways, but to listen yeah. and to evolve the agenda around what the members think yeah. and, and, and staying in alignment with where the industry's going. Right. What's one thing about Bill Maine that no one would ever guess, whether it be a hobby or a secret or something like that, that nobody would ever guess about you? Oh boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, pr probably, 
probably they would never guess that I have three 25 year old triplets. Wow. I did not even know that one. That's a yep. great one. I got married in my early 40s. I'd never been married. I, I uh, met a, a lady nurse in Chicago. We fell in love. She said, what do you think about kids? And I said, are you kidding? You're 42 years old. And she said, just watch me. And 11 months later, we had triplets. And I think that's probably some kind of a world record. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> well, that's but awesome. For me, for, for, for me, as a mature parent and as a professional, in my 40s and 50s and 60s, of course, raising children is very, very different than in your 20s and 30s. Yes. You have a different life experience. And so it's kind of a standing joke amongst my kids. That, you know, I, I'm a consultant in mm -hmm. the family. And, um, <laughs> and, and being, this, the, being that they were born as triplets at the same time, you know, we, we tackled every single problem um, with them uh, and on a very contemporaneous basis. And then when yeah. they were 12, when they were th 13, um, my poor wife uh, got brain cancer and died. And so I was the lone ranger through their high school and college years as a parent. And that was another dimension yeah. that made them, you know, really take on life with a whole different set of, of uh, challenges. But by the same time, and everyone in your audience would know this, what, what, where we get stronger and better is through challenge and adversity. You can't True. feel sorry for yourself. You just got to move on right. and, and turn adversarial situations into positives. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's a, that's a, uh, I, I did not know that. And I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to, uh, hopefully someday meet them because I, uh, I'm sure that you were a great father growing up. Uh, I don't know about triplets that would, that would, man, that's, that's a tough one that, that in high school and stuff that had to be tough on you being a single father, trying to raise three kids together. Well, it comes down though. It comes down to, you know, it's not what happens to you. It's how you deal with it. True. And I, I dealt with it. I think my consulting background, my restaurant tour background helped me, but basically, you know, we, we, we just got together the four of us yeah. and, made the decision that, you know, we were moving forward in a positive way. Yeah. And to that end, uh, I, to, I have two boys and a girl, and, uh, or a young woman, I should say. <laughs> and to, to what I had a chance to observe and continue to observe is this incredible ascension of the woman into the workplace. Yeah, uh, it, it It is just, and of course, it's it's replete in FCSI with, with professional members, mm -hmm. but women have not only arrived, but now they lead. And I, I yeah. really, really, really have enjoyed watching my daughter grow. Yeah. We've um, got a lot of members. I mean, it's probably our biggest growth area right now over the last few years has been women becoming professional members of an FCSI and, and serving on committees and boards. And as, as you know, our next chair, of the Americas is is a woman, Christine, out of uh, Minneapolis. So, um, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun to watch that growth, and and I take great pride in the fact that our association is one of those that's showing that. Um, not everything is, so it's it's something that's kind of fun to watch. I like being on the leading edge of something. Well, I think that's absolutely right, and and the reason, ultimately, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, is I think women. Uh, generally speaking, are well suited to the hospitality industry mm -hmm. and food service industry. They, they really, it's a natural for them. And um, they, uh, I think, have a better sensitivity a lot of times, less ego involved. And the, the ego issue goes back. We've got some great restaurateurs out there with gigantic e egos, n yeah. no question. But in terms of our constituency, if you're going to be in the food service, hospitality, and restaurant business, you better lose your ego at the door and start listening. And I think yeah. women are better listeners. I agree. What are uh, what are the top five or top three, top five things you've witnessed during this COVID crisis that restaurants are needing to change in order to survive the next few 
let's say, next three to five years? Well, in my latest blog with FCSI, I addressed that question because right. uh, I'm, I'm asked it a lot. Right. And I think it really comes down to the willingness of the operator who's now facing, at all levels, extinction to go back to the fundamentals mm -hmm. and go back to the fundamentals which are not fun. You know, getting in shape is not fun. Yeah. <laughs> Lifting weights is not fun. Uh, uh, going on a diet is not fun. Anything that relates to disciplines is probably not much fun. So the, the three areas that I believe are the, are the most important is, and the overarching area is you can't feel sorry for yourself. You've got to attack. That was why the article, When in Doubt, Attack. I was really pleased with that um, title because I, I think that's what it comes down to. you got to attack. Yeah. And if I if I'm talking to prospective clients and and I feel and they want to talk about everything the government's done to them, I I really can't help them because that that's old news. Yeah. It's it you know, we're out in the lifeboat in the middle of the ocean, we got to figure <laughs> out how to survive. Right. And and the three pieces of the puzzle are, are uh, overall are, are I think job descriptions, um weekly calculations of food and beverage costs. And then using mystery shoppers as a yeah. part of your whole marketing platform. And I read that article, and I think the mystery shopper part that you've talked about is probably one of the most, right now, the most important things, especially if you're an absentee owner, that you should be employing at some point. Um, because you need to know what, that, what your customer is experiencing when they walk in the door. Um, because it's yep. not, if, especially if you're an absentee person, because... Where I live in Bloomington, Illinois, a lot of absentee ownership, and they have no idea what's really going on in their storefront right now, um, good and bad. Uh, there's some that need to be really uh, uh, glorified and need to be you know, applauded, and then there's some that are really bad, and they would have no clue that they're not even open half the time right now. I'm convinced right, that that's right. happening right now. So, well, that's, that's the, the, the that's the that's the initial that's the initial question. And for yeah, uh, when I get um, uh, prospects, sometimes I will actually consider doing a mystery shop in advance of even going into the place, right? Because what the what the mystery shop does is it structures, it creates right. a structure. And our industry is a structured industry. We are as good as the systems and guidelines and formats and handbooks. We're a complicated business. Yeah. And without the discipline, without that discipline, I don't care how big the organization is, that discipline is critical. And it isn't about, with mystery shops, it isn't about what's actually being reported. It's about the fact that the staff knows mm -hmm. that there's independent third party overview mm -hmm. that that's the psychological lift that makes such a huge huge difference yeah i agree well that's all the formal questions i've got for you today bill but before we get going as you've seen in on tap before i like to end with a little bit of fun uh so i've got some off the wall questions of would you rather i'd like to go through uh before we end everything um and i'll just jump okay. right into these um the first one is, would you rather have the ability to move things with your mind or the ability to read minds? Move things with my mind. Okay. The first one. Would you rather be forced to sing along with every song you hear or dance to every song you hear? Sing along. Okay. I got a bad knee. <laughs> would you rather be chronically <laughs> underdressed or overdressed? Underdressed. Would you rather have universal respect or unlimited power? Universal respect. Would you rather never be able to go out during the day or never be able to go out during the night? Never being uh, able to go out during the night. Okay. Would you rather lounge by the pool or lounge by the beach? I'd rather lounge by the beach and fish. Okay. Would you rather wear the same socks for a month or the same underwear for a week. Same socks for a month. Okay. Would you rather spend a week in the forest or a night in a real haunted house? I think a week in the forest. Would you rather get a paper cut every time you turn a page or bite your tongue every time you eat? 
bite my tongue every time when, when I eat. Would you rather have skin that changes color based on your emotions, or would you rather have tattoos that appear all over your body showing what you did yesterday? <laughs> the first one. Okay. No tattoos. Would you rather be beautiful and stupid or unattractive and a genius? Unattractive genius. Okay. Would you rather only eat pizza for a year or not be able to eat any pizza for five years? Not be able to eat any pizza for five years. Would you rather give up cursing forever or give up desserts for five years? I'd rather give up desserts for five years. <laughs> okay. And last but not least, would you rather go backstage with your favorite band or be an extra on your favorite TV show? I'd probably rather be an extra on my favorite TV show. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I've got for you today, Bill. How can people find out more about you and your firm? The best way to get a, get a hold of me would be to send me an email. Uh, okay. I do my entire my entire world. It's BillMain41, the digits at gmail.com. Okay. Um, or, or, of course, through FCSI and my cell phone numbers on there as well. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I like to keep it simple, and if people want to call me, all they got to do is text me okay. and introduce themselves. We'll set up a time and be glad to talk to them. Perfect. Well, that wraps up this edition of On Tap, presented by FCSI of the Americas. A huge thank you to Bill for joining us today. We couldn't do it without members like you. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your favorite podcast, and turn on those notifications so that you don't miss out on any future episodes. But until then, cheers. Cheers.